Um, this is the first opportunity I've had to present some of my data, so it's actually really quite exciting for me. Um, but first of all, just what we're going to cover today, um, just look at some of the asthma facts. Think about the NRAD report. Look at the Nuffield Trust report, which some of you may be familiar with, which was just recently launched. And then looking at spotting the at-risk child. And then what can we do? So some practical things to think about what we can actually do to make some improvements. I'm going to finish off with some advice from the parents. So one of the questions I asked the parents after they told me about the experience they had with their child dying was, what do you want clinicians to know? What do you want them to know to make improvements so that other families don't go through this? So some really lovely quotes from then and then some questions. So just some of the asthma facts. So in Scotland, there's currently 3, uh, 368,000 people with asthma, so that equates to one in 14, who are currently receiving treatment. Um, this includes 72,000 children and 296,000 adults. Every three seconds, someone in the UK is experiencing an asthma attack. Now, you may be familiar with Asthma UK's previous report that said every 10 seconds, someone's experiencing an attack. However, they refined this on how patients perceive themselves to be experiencing attacks. So the, the um, number of attacks haven't gone up. However, how patients perceive attacks has slightly changed. With regards to children, we know that a child is admitted to hospital every 20 minutes and there's been a rise in asthma deaths in Scotland since 2014, whenever it was at an all time low. So maybe a bit difficult to see, however, these are the statistics provided. And if you look at 2014, there was 72 deaths in Scotland, which if we looked at the previous year of 105, that was a vast improvement. However, over the last three years where statistics have been recorded, this number has escalated. Um, and in 2017, there was 126 deaths due to asthma. <coughs> If we look at um, coding and consider the breakdown of male versus female deaths, we'll see that there is, is a majority towards the females. And we know that in um, adulthood, there are more females affected by asthma than males. So the key report that we keep going back to is the NRAD report, Why Asthma Still Kills. This was published in May 2014, and it was the results of a confidential inquiry which took place between February 2012 until the end of January 2013. The aims of this project were to propose what would need to change in order to prevent future deaths, to make recommendations for clinical practice and service provision, and to raise awareness of and increase understanding of asthma amongst professionals and the public and in people with asthma themselves. But that wasn't the first inquiry. If we look, um, just uh, these are a few um, reports that have been carried out. Um, back to as far back as 1982 was one of the first reports that is documented in the literature. And we see there's also been a Scottish confidential inquiry into asthma deaths in 1999. Unfortunately, if you read all the reports, the messages keep coming back over and over again. So key things that were identified from the, the NRAD report were that there was a failure to seek help at the time of an attack. And I think we've all been in that um, position, um, you know, talking about emergency appointments, patients um, ringing first thing in the morning, uh, seeking help at out of hours. But often it's got to do with those subtle changes in the patients and often they leave it far too late before they, they call for help. Adherence has been mentioned over and over again, and we know that patients who are on long-term treatment are poor adherers to treatment, sometimes as a result of non-intentional adherence. And certainly I had a conversation with a teenager the other day who swore blind she wasn't forgetting to take treatment, but when we looked at her emergency care summary, she hadn't um, ordered an inhaled steroid for six months. So she obviously couldn't be taking something that wasn't available. We have overuse and over-reliance on the sibutamol inhaler, and there has been some work, which I will present later on, um, to try and tackle that. And then we've got the social and psychological factors. So how many of us have reviewed a patient who had maybe previous good control 
all of a sudden things have been going out of control and it turns out they've bought themselves a hypoallergenic dog. Um, or there's also some psychological factors more prevalent in our adults uh, population rather than children. However, we are aware that there are more and more mental health issues affecting young people. Other things were the failure to attend review appointments. So we know how difficult that is to get patients in, um, especially whenever they're well, because they don't always prioritise their health. There was a documented lack of asthma action plans available for our patients. And there was also a failure to recognise trigger factors. And finishing off, there was poor inhaler technique, and that comes up over and over again. So if we look at the children um, that were included within the NRAD, there were 28 children in total. And you'll see there was children under the age of 10 and children between the age of 10 and 19. What I've highlighted in red is the fact that the majority of these children were actually dead before they presented to a and &E. So they were out of hospital arrests and there was nothing anyone could do by the time emergency services reached them. Or in some cases, parents have carried um, their child through to a and &E, um, in a collapsed state and unfortunately um, not able to resuscitate them. The other thing just to have a quick look at there is the potentially avoidable factors related to parents, their families and their environments and things that we think about there are exposure to secondhand smoke um, and also pets. So you may have seen on the media about um, six weeks ago, the launch of a report, and it basically told us that our young people were more at risk of having an asthma death than um, their peers in other countries. What I would point out is something that Hilary pointed out earlier about inhaler technique. All of these patients um, are not using spacers. And again, the visual there is the, the importance of the blue inhaler, whereas we want to be promoting preventative treatment. So we're really trying to push towards preventative treatment with spacers in our images. So the Nuffield Trust produced this report and it was an international comparison of health and well-being in adolescents and early adulthood. <laughs> so what we know is that young people aged between 10 and 24 make up a fifth of the population of the most high income countries. And what they did was they compared 17 key indicators of health and well-being amongst 19 developed countries. And asthma was included as one of the health conditions. So this may be difficult to see, but in comparison with the other countries, the, um, we were worse than the majority of the countries when it came to um, asthma deaths. And although there had been some improvement um, with asthma deaths, this has actually halted. They then produced these tables and this refers to children aged between 10 and 14. And you can see with the exception of the US, New Zealand and Australia, we have ranked fourth highest um, for asthma deaths with this age group. It gets worse if you're aged between uh, 15 and 19. And with the exception of New Zealand, we score as one of the top places um, with our young people being at risk of asthma deaths. We then have the cohort of um, young adults where we're calling these emerging adults now because between the age of, um, up to the age of 24, brains are still developing. So in fact, they still have the same brain power as an adolescent. Um, so really they should be viewed as an adolescent when you are reviewing them. And again, you can see that the risk of death with this group is equal to the children aged between 10 and 14. What they also found um, with this report was that young children from deprived areas were twice as likely to be admitted to hospital. They were more likely to smoke and there was ex more exposure to air pollution. And you may be aware of some of the projects that are currently being undertaken in London with a, about air pollution and exposure and how we are trying to make improvements. Um, but I think that'll take quite some time. So the conclusion from the Nuffield report was that there was a lack of provision of basic care and that there was poor understanding of symptoms by both young people and healthcare providers. 
If we think about spotting the child at risk, this um, was a systematic review which was undertaken by a team that Hillary was involved with. And it looked at children um, who could potentially be at risk of an asthma attack, but it excluded some of the variables. So for example, um, it didn't include studies where children were affected by um, viral illness, and it took out things like um, uh, pollen exposure, so hay fever. So looked at things that were could be static all year round. And this is a bubble plot. Um, and what you'll see from that is the largest bubbles were the ones that placed most emphasis um, on, on risk. And the biggest risk factor for young people were previous asthma attacks and persistent symptoms. So things that we really need to be considering how we're going to manage. So what can we do to make improvements? So the NRAD report put together 19 recommendations and a lot of these recommendations, unfortunately, haven't been implemented. Mark Levy, some of you may be aware of, he's a GP down in London um, and he undertook an audit within his clinical area to look at the management of children and young people with asthma. And some of his recommendations were, it's really important to consider an asthma attack as a sign of treatment failure. So it's not just an asthma attack, it's something that we really need to be proactive about. And there are three reasons given for why treatment hasn't worked. The most, um, the most obvious one is they're not taking treatment. So we know adherence is a huge issue. But sometimes therapy needs to be increased. So sometimes our patients may have started a long time ago on low dose inhaled steroids. However, there may be other trigger factors that have come along, um, time of year, hormones, um, other exposure to, to um, uh, pollution or something in the environment. And the therapy needs to be increased or simply that treatment's not working. So Andrew talked about phenotype in our patients. So not all treatments suit one patient, some treatments suit other patients, and we need to think about tailored treatment for our patients. So hopefully over the next wee while, we're gonna hear more about the importance of the post-attack review. So the recommendations for BTS and SIGN um, are that all patients who have had a hospital admission or an A&E attendance um, with an asthma attack should be reviewed in primary care 48 hours after discharge, which is an impossible task, isn't it? We're all really busy clinicians and it's really difficult to predict whether our patients are going to end up um, going into hospital and therefore needing a review. Their suggestion, however, is would it be possible within your practice to hold one slot with a, an appropriately trained person that if it wasn't used, could be filled the day before? So another patient could actually um, use that, that slot if it wasn't taken up. And the important things to consider in a post attack review, it's not a simple, how are you, are you better, very good. It's thinking about what was the trigger factor for that event. So have they been able to identify what made them get worse? And then if it's something that they could avoid in the future, giving some advice on that also. Important to review adherence on each occasion. And I've now started opening the emergency care summaries within my practice, because um, that's all I have available. And will challenge the patients if it looks very obvious that they haven't had a repeat prescription for quite some time. We need to consider there are different reasons for um, not adhering to medicines and sometimes it can be simply because people forget or asthma isn't a priority so they think they've taken it but maybe not taken it at all. It's really important to um, review inhaler techniques, so encouraging our patients to bring along their spacers, their inhalers, their dry powder devices, so their techniques can be reviewed and so that we can give some advice on how to make improvements. Um, IO had produced uh, a wee demonstration down at the bottom about Mike Shield's study about remote dot, which involved the young people uploading videos of them taking their inhaler um, and sending it to the nurse for comment. All these children, before they enrolled in the study, their um, inhaler technique was perfect. Whenever they were uploading, they had lots of different um, advice to be given how to improve because they were all lying slumped to the side or lying on their back um, and not taking their medication appropriately. So there's always um, 
room for making improvements to technique. Again, Belfast do also um, advise a technique called co teaching to goal, where you would get your patient to demonstrate inhaler technique three times during your consultation. So it sounds like a bit unachievable, but as soon as they come through the door, demonstrate technique. After a first kind of slot of information, check technique, and then check te technique again before you go home. And there is evidence that that does actually work. And then really importantly, that every patient with asthma has a management plan. We'll then move on to the overuse of SABAs. Um, so there is a recommendation that there should be a limit set um, quick show of hands, do people set limits on prescribing for SABAs within their clinical practice? Hillary? Yeah. So it's very difficult, isn't it? So we know that 12 inhalers a year, um, a year is excessive. That's going through one a month. Um, so what should that limit be? So should it be six? Should it be nine? Should it be 12? But with children, we know that they need two for school, they need two for after school, they need two for their mums, two for their dads, some at their grannies, some in the car. So before you know it, sometimes these patients have actually ordered 10 subutamol inhalers, but really just want to have them there and available and never use them. So it's just about thinking about if there has been a large amount of inhalers ordered by the, um, this child or this family, then is it an appropriate time to bring them in for a review? Or is it appropriate to carry out a telephone review just to check that maybe that is the story? One of my PhD colleagues, Shona McKibben, um, also carried out some work looking at the use of electronic alerts in primary care. And there is some evidence to prove that this is helpful. However, it would be as part of a, a complete package. So not just as a standalone initiative. When we look at supported self-management plan, um, plans, it's more than just providing an asthma, uh, asthma action plan. So we can provide a written plan to our patients. However, this needs to form part of a uh, supported um, platform. So really important that they have education. Um, children don't like being talked at, so they don't retain that information. So you need to try wherever possible to make things as visual, uh, visual as possible. So they're visual learners. So if you've got photographs that you can print out, laminate, talk through, or if you've got your iPad um, or your computer screen, they like that. Um, you would go through the provision of the plan and some of the key recommendations from the NRAD report were that you included trigger factors so that the patients were able to have a reminder what their trigger factors were but each time that you reviewed them you would be considering again was there a new trigger factor that had come along. As Hilary said just including things about other things and um, so example if they've got allergic rhinitis you can include that in the asthma management plan. For us a lot of our patients um, have got food allergies so we would include treatment um, for food allergy as well. And really important to think about risks. So what are the risk factors for these um, children and young people? So have they started smoking? Do they know the effects of cigarette smoking? Do they know about the effects of vaping? Um, and then thinking about involving them in a problem solving approach. So what I do with the kids whenever they come along to clinic, rather than just say, this is what you would do in the, if you had an asthma attack, I ask them to tell me, so your mum's gone out, you're at home with your sibling or your brother or your sister, or whatever, um, and you're having an asthma attack, what would you do? The first thing they say is I would phone my mum. Um, and I'll tell them your mum's phone switched off, what are you going to do? And usually they can problem solve and work what they would um, have to do with taking their blue inhaler and thinking about when they would phone for help. We also give them the scenario, um, what would happen when you phone 999? Because it's something that they will never have done. So we, I usually pretend to be the call handler and say, which service do you, and they kind of give me the information. Um, so it's a good way of getting them involved in thinking about what they would do in the event of having an attack. And I do it each time I see them. And also it works really well with children with food allergy. So just to kind of finish off, I'm going to give you um, some face, uh, quotes from face-to-face -face interviews with the parents. 
And this is what they want you to know um, and um, implement into your practice. So the biggest thing, or one of the biggest things that they want people to be aware of is that we need to change attitude about asthma. So one of the parents whose um, eight-year-old son died, she said, I was just one of those people, it was just asthma. Nothing's gonna happen. And the amount of times when I think back, if he was having a bad night and he was a wee bit wheezy, and I want to say crabbit, a typical wee boy, huffy, crabbit-like. Oh, it's just your asthma, there's nothing wrong with you. Another mum, um, her son was, was 10 years old when he died, she said they were just blasé to it and don't appreciate how bad I can be. And they just think that's all right, they'll be fine in a minute and it's really not like that. So they want more information. So whatever information we are giving, it's not enough. So they want more information. So Again, the mum of the 10 year old, she says, I think for professionals dealing with children with asthma and the families, I think there should definitely be a lot more information given to them of the different types of asthma attacks that you can have. I think if the professionals can enable the parents and the families to understand asthma better, they might not necessarily be so many appointments back to the GPs for things that should be managed at home. The lack of knowledge through through nobody's fault really, because I think everybody just assumes that they know what they're doing with asthma. And because it's just asthma and it's just that inhaler, they go, you've got asthma, here's your inhaler, see you later. If you've got any problems, come back. One of the biggest things that, that came out of this study was that actually a lot of these families never appreciated you could die from asthma. So. Um, and I asked them, how would you bring that up in a conversation? Because I think we're all very conscious. We don't want to upset people. We don't want them dwelling on this. However, they give some really good advice um, when it came to that. Because realistically, they all need it. They all need to know that what the worst case scenario could be. And I do think sometimes it's danced around, not by everybody. And obviously not all professionals are the same. As much as it's scary, and there may probably be some parents or family members out there that don't want to hear it, and might not necessarily appreciate being told that, but I think in the long run, it's better. And I would rather have a parent upset and anxious for a few days while they get their head around that possibility than them not thinking that could happen and lose their child. Because they've maybe been a bit blasé to it through no fault of their own. You know, everybody knows that if you have an asthma attack, you can end up in hospital, you can't breathe, but not many people know it can kill you. Another quote from another mum um, of a, a kind of 19-year-old, um, because I did think, how can an asthma attack leave you dead? I couldn't get it to that extent. I didn't realise an asthma attack could cause a cardiac arrest. It might frighten them, but if it makes them realise just how serious it is. And another mum um, of a 15 year old uh, girl who died, her friends were absolutely, like the young people were absolutely gobsmacked that asthma could kill you. That was the one thing that was coming through with every single of her school friends and her friends. Her friends, her social clubs, everybody was. The thing everybody said was, I didn't know asthma could kill you. And the school decided to have an awareness day. And just our last quote from our um, parents. But I do think that anybody that gets the diagnosis with asthma needs to know what can happen because they need to know what to be able to do and they need to know what to look for. But I understand it is hard to tell people that without them getting worried and panicking about it and stuff like that. I mean, we were young parents with a young child. I never knew. I mean, maybe we did hear, but maybe you heard about it because it was an older person. The other thing they want to, is, is for people to listen to them. So some of the um, data that's produced talks about how parents and families self-manage asthma. So we see them maybe once a year for a 15 minute review if they're well controlled. Um, but some, so for the rest of the time, they're self-managing and they're living with a lot, but they want us to listen to them and ask them how they are. So if they've got any concerns, we've got an agenda with a consultation, haven't we? We've got our questions that we want to ask. We do our, our bits and bobs, but sometimes we forget at the end of the consultation, just to finish with, is there anything that's worrying you or concerning you? So on looking back on it, the only thing that does that I feel might have gone better in the last year 
um, or year and a half, I think was in, uh, she was in hospital about five times. And I just feel, I wish, or the hospital had said, look, this isn't right. We need, to, there's something going on here. We need to get to the bottom of this. This is happening too much now. And the young person, she had put a comment on her Facebook page saying, I'm now breaking a world record. I've been in hospital with my asthma for five times in a year and a half. One of our other mums um, wanted us to consider a typical presentation. So if we look at BTS and sign guideline, the recommendation is to consider asthma if there's more than one of the following, cough, wheeze, tightness of chest, shortness of breath. Um, so her daughter um, developed some respiratory symptoms in uh, late December and by April she was dead. Um, she didn't have a background history of asthma, she was a non-smoker, but she um, had a persistent cough and she was breathless on exertion. Whenever we talked through um, other things, she talked about having panic attacks, but really it, it sounds like they were, she was having asthma attacks which were self-resolving. So what um, she wants you to know, but uh, for her, this is her big, that it's not, um, that is what I want to get out there. So that is what I tell, I want to tell people, look, this is what, how my daughter died. So don't think that an asthma attack had to be that wheezing because it's not. So that's where I get very frustrated when people say, oh, there's not a wheeze. It's not asthma because there's not a wheeze. You know, and I want to tell people that if you can see somebody presenting with these symptoms, if they've got a persistent cough, then push for, you know, because maybe had she been prescribed steroids, oral steroids at some point, then maybe things um, would have had a different outcome. This is just a final quote um, from one of the parents. And she said, it's not something in this day and age that, you should, that should take so many lives, really. So I just want to leave that with you. It's a really challenging and um, a challenging for all of us, I think, work. And um, you know, thank you for all the work that you're doing on this. I'm sure it's interesting people. Does anybody want to ask um, anything? Um, comment? From a practical perspective, <coughs> how we can respond to these challenges that the, the patients are throwing out to us? Yes? Mm. I'll make one comment. Uh, I think it's a great presentation. Um, I think we have a major problem in Scotland with the child death review process. I think if you look at not just the Nuffield report, but all these reports on child death, um, we outnumber any country with the same GDP, if you look at Italy. Um, and so I think there's a big problem with data and collecting data. And I think the NRAD was kind of welcome for, for your specialty. But this is the same for uh, mine's paediatric oncology. We have the same data for lymphoma and every other cancer we don't do as well as the other countries. So there's a very big problem in Scotland that we have. That's number one. Number two, when you do look at, um, I think, what the parent story is about asthma being a serious illness. I, d I don't quite know how you get that message out there. In paediatric oncology, we don't have a problem with adherence. That doesn't surprise people, but we don't. All of my patients take the chemo, they're prescribed pretty much. Um, so we do have a problem. And I don't know how you shift some of the responsibility. And I've been a paediatrician about 15, 16 years now. And I've, I don't see a shift in Scotland with putting some of the responsibility back to parents because it's unpopular. But most of the data seems to stand out across most of the specialties. And if you look at the child, act, that doesn't do anything either. It doesn't even mention the parental responsibility. And I don't know how we move that forward when you look at the actual data about what's causing some of this. Some of it has to end up with the parents. Uh, and you have to be able to say that. But I don't know what you think about that. I totally agree. One of the things that our family said was just how they're, they're receiving information, though, um, you know, whenever you do a consultation with a patient, they hear the first 30 seconds, they maybe hear a wee bit before they leave. So they have talked about why is there not more um, on television? So there's stuff about strokes, there's stuff about, you know, oncology as in, you know, charities and stuff, but they want to have stuff out there about asthma and recognizing asthma attacks. And we're also gonna look at um, some initiatives about just putting some um, infographics up around schools so that if you're walking past the same poster every day, or if you're sitting in the loo, you maybe see, oh, right, maybe I need to think about that so it's just it's, it's, it's a different way of trying to get information across and also trying to get people to prioritize health and unfortunately they don't but thank you for your comments
Um, I was testing a patient of 15 on an exercise induced asthma challenge test. As soon as he walked in, the parent was like, oh, they're just not as fit as their brother. She's just a bit lazier. She doesn't do as much. Two and a half minutes into the run, I stopped her because she sounded like she was going to collapse and she dropped by 30% in her spirometry. It sounded awful, but he was like, oh, she actually is ill then. And it was just kind of taking that kind of serious, like their child's actually just complaining. It's not just because they're not as fit as their brother. It was like, it was awful. I was just sitting there in the wee girl and the crying. I was like, but yeah, so it's like engaging the parents and realising that it's not just all this telly things you're getting told, or they play PlayStation too much to do this. They're not getting outside anymore. That, that still exists. The asthma's existed the whole time, which is picking up and getting the parents to engage a bit better as well. Yeah. I was just, just going to say um, thanks. That was a really good talk. I, I'm a GP in Edinburgh, and we've recently had a brilliant facility of a um, specialist pharmacist who prescribes, who's able to do reviews for. Um, children and adults with asthma in the practice offering half hour appointments where they're able to go all, through all these things but time and time again the problem is it's those hardcore patients who are ordering more than 12 short acting beta agonist inhalers a year who don't come in and don't, we know those are you know maybe have like 20 patients in the practice who are the hardcore non-attenders they don't take the preventers and it's really how do you reach those patients because we write them letters we offer you know these kind of reviews but they don't want to come in and they just keep requesting more and that's these are the people you know are going to be in hospital it's, it's just it's really hard because I don't know if there's a mad you know I suppose it follows on from the previous talk as well but it's how do we engage those patients that don't want to engage yeah. And I think they have been um, talking about different ways to reach people because it's sometimes difficult as, as a working parent to bring your child along, get them out of school. So we need to be more inventive and more creative with the way we're reviewing our patients. We should be looking at Skype, which they use remote and rurally. Um, we should look at telephone reviews. We should look at you know other methods to, to contact our families to fit in you know, I suppose it's not all about fitting in around them. We need to kind of work together, don't we? Um, but even thinking about school um, approaches as well. So the school nurses are so busy, but actually there has been evidence to, to support school programmes. And if we can educate children at a young age, a lot of them take on responsibility for, for administering their inhaled steroids kind of age 10. By age 16, they should be fully in control of their um, medications. So I think we just need to be creative and work together. And you've just slipped out the back door, which is an awful pity, you have a train to catch. Uh, awful pity, because he was, has erisotrol, of course, is going to try and help practices by flagging at everybody in the practices aware, probably not the only you know, solution, but it's one to try and bring people on. Uh, just to add to that, could we, for this difficult cohort of patients, could we think about mark therapy, you know? Yeah, in paediatrics, we're not there yet. Um, there is a license for the adolescents, but I think there's a lot of work around using um, a single inhaler um, for, for treating <coughs> asthma. So for those not familiar, it's just using a combination for relief and preventative treatment. Um, so we just need to kind of work around there. But I think that will come for, for a certain cohort. You threw out a challenge or something. We've got to finish for lunch, but um, you threw out a challenge about how in primary care we counted the number of blue inhalers. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how many people put their hands just up. You, Hillary. Just you, Hilary. So I thought I would just share what we do. I don't know whether it works. I've never trialled it. But um, what we do, you know how you're the prescriber, the repeat prescribing, I don't know what yours defaults to, but originally the one in our practice defaulted to two blue inhalers at a time. It was a standard that came up. That was when we were using vision. Um, I changed that to one, so it defaulted to one. Clinicians could override it if they wished, of course, but it defaulted to one. Um, the second thing I do is it defaulted to only four repeats before somebody had to review it. Now, that means that when it got to four, now if somebody only had four repeat inhalers over five years, I probably wouldn't be so worried. Whereas if somebody had had four blue inhalers and it came up to me to look at over three months, I'd clearly notice it. Um, and at that point, I'd start making phone calls. So it's just something to do with the default settings, which as clinicians, we can clearly override if we recognise it as being inappropriate. But that was just a default setting that everybody in the practice had to live with. Um, I don't know whether they minded <laughs> the rest of my partners in the practice. But just share that one quickly with you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much, Anthony. <laughs>